Last, last week, we, we saw how God is summing up everything in Jesus. And we saw, we read in verse 10, if you look at verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 1, we focused in on that verse, which is kind of like the mountaintop. When you're at, when you're at that verse, you're kind of like on Google Earth looking down at the, the broad expanse of what God is up to. And what God is up to, what He is doing is He is at work bringing everything together under the headship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what He's doing right now. That's what, that's what our work here on planet Earth is, to, is, is, is for. Now, the Bible there says uses some words. We went into this last week, and I won't go back into it because you can always listen to it in the CD. But it says that He will put this plan that he has purposed in Christ into effect when the times will have reached their what? Their fulfillment. Their fulfillment. And one of the things I didn't talk about last week is when is that fulfillment? Now before I go into when is the fulfillment, I want to say that the church, we saw how the things that we're awaiting for, the, the fullness of what God will do in that time, that period of time that's called the fullness of time, is already happening, is already breaking in to the present, and is reflected in the church in the body of Christ. Paul tells us that in chapter 1, and we read it a little bit in chapter 4 about how to flesh that out, about how the church should be, we should be concerned about unity in the body of Christ. We should be humble uh, to, to uh, lay down any issues that, that we have. We should strive. In fact, Paul pleads with the Ephesian church. Paul pleads for them to be united, to be of, of one mind, of, of one accord. When The last time that this happened perfectly, and really every time, every revival and visitation of God occurs when the church is walking in this unity in the bond of love. And if you that's highlighted in... in uh, in the book of Acts in chapter 2 uh, and in chapter 1, it says that the church was in one mind, homo thumidon, one mind and one accord. And because they were in one mind and in one accord, in that unity, the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out. And the rest was history. The rest was history. That's why the unity is so crucial. That's why when we sense any sort of division or separation, and it's palpable, right? You can feel that in churches. Many of you have left churches because you've been hurt and wounded uh, because of division and disunity. And we saw how that is the full-time work of the enemy to, to make that happen. And we often, we take the bait. He sets the trap, we take the bait. And sometimes we, what we do is we, we judge falsely. There, I, I would love to, one of these days, have our good friend, Kathy Walters, I've already extended the invitation to come and speak on that spirit of false judgment. Because we look at people and we think that we have them figured out. We think that we know their soul, then we actually get to know them. <laughs> Boy, that's happened to me many times. With some of you, I've entered into false judgment. But we're all on a learning curve, right? And that, that's why there's there's this vast ocean of forgiveness available in Christ. I've had to ask forgiveness for many of you. Some of you. <laughs> and, you know, this is a beautiful picture in the book of Revelation, you know, in, in chapter 4 when it describes the throne room. There's this ocean in front of the throne of clear crystal water. And that, that's a, a picture of the, just the, the vastness of God's love and His ability and His desire to just forgive and to wash us. And so this fullness should be reflected now in the church, and it is. When, when we gather together, we are the body of Christ. This is why so many beautiful things happen on Sunday uh, or when we have a corporate gathering or in small groups. Any sort of intimate, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name. Speaking of gatherings, last night we had our first Spanish service, uh, and God was glorified in this place. There were how many? 59 people? 
59 people came and we sang and worshiped in Spanish and it was wonderful. Uh, we're giving glory to God for that. That's just the first one. Um, we're going to be announcing uh, there, every month we're going to have a Spanish gathering. I'll tell you more about that later. But when does this fullness come? Well, you know, the Bible tells us a little bit. I just want to kind of touch on this um, because I want to expand this word grace today to you and talk to you about how God has lavished his grace upon us. But in Romans 11, can we do a little bit of a pre you know, sort of deliberate rabbit trail here for a moment? Um, in Romans 11:25, Paul goes into the... Um, that expands and gives a little more information about when that fullness will come. And I believe that that fullness will come at the end of the age. As we have learned before, for the Hebrew mind, there were only two ages. There was this present age and the age to come. Now, we as the church are already experiencing the blessings of the age to come in part, not in fullness, but in part. And those of you who have been part of Vineyard Bible Institute have taken an in-depth course on the kingdom of God. We have been learning about how that period of time, that age to come, began to break in with the coming of Christ and has, has been breaking in ever since. It's coming toward us. And that's the essence of the prayer. You know, that at the end of the book of Revelation, it says, even so, come Lord Jesus. We're praying and longing for the age to come when Jesus will sit on the throne and He will rule the nations of the world and He will bring peace. He will bring lasting peace. And Paul talks about this time. He says in verse, uh, he's been talking about Israel. He talks about Israel. And when he talks about Israel here, he's talking about Israel after the flesh, national ethnic Israel. This is not a spiritualization of the church. This is not, you know, spiritual Israel. This is, this is, these are national ethnic Jewish people that he's talking about. And he says in verse 25 of chapter 11, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. He's talking to Gentiles, and he's saying, don't get up on your high horse and boast about what you have in Christ and what the Jewish people don't have. Because he says, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. The fullness, some of your translations say, of the Gentiles. That's the same fullness that Paul is talking about in, in chapter 1. The fullness of the plan of God. And so it says in verse 26, And so all Israel will be saved. Not just the remnant, but all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And so the nation that we now know as Israel, where if you go to Israel, you quickly discover that it's a very secular nation. Even though there are more and more Jewish people are coming to faith in Christ in record numbers, for the most part, Israel is not, it's not even a Jewish nation. It's a very secular nation. But the Bible tells us that to Jacob, now anytime you see the word Jacob, what, what was Jacob's name changed to? It was named to, is, to Israel. Often when God refers to Israel as Jacob, he's talking about, you know, the old man, you know, and, and, and the, the, what Israel used to be. He changed his name from Jacob to Israel. More on that later, but he says, God will turn, the deliverer will turn the godlessness from Jacob. And so that nation that we read about in the newspaper, they're, they're going to experience tremendous revival. And verse 27, this is my covenant with them. My covenant, when I take away, look at, when I take away their sins. So they've experienced a, a hardness, but I'm going to come, I've not forgotten that, them. And I have a covenant with them. God's covenant is, is sure. And it's secure. And then he says, verse 28, As far as the gospel is concerned, they're enemies on your account. The Romans were experiencing persecution. 
but they're loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and His calling are irrevocable. His call, His gifts are irrevocable. Just as you were sometime, at one time disobedient to God and have now received mercy, verse 30, as a result of their disobedience. I don't want to go further into that right now because it'll take me too far of a rabbit trail from what I want to talk to you about. But I, I forgot to say, when is this fullness coming? It's coming. <laughs> uh, just sit back. Well, don't sit back. Uh, but it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Um, but let's step back for a moment and look at a word in, in chapter 1 that we're going to read over and over and over in this book. In fact, I think 12 times in the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about grace. And I've been studying a lot on this, and I ran across some things that I want to share with you. Um, what does Paul mean when he says grace, when he uses the word grace? We need to understand that because it's at the heart of, first of all, understanding what God has for us and getting really excited about it versus just being lackadaisical and you know, having the Bible stored away on, in collecting dust. What did Paul, what was he thinking about when in verse 7 he says that God has lavished us with his grace? What, what did Paul mean by that? And to, to, get the, to grasp this and to begin to understand it, we have to remember that Paul is a Jew and he, is, he thinks like a Jew, but he's using Greek equivalents to communicate something that he knows as a Jewish person. So often... The Greek word that we see in the New Testament is a transliteration of something wonderful in Hebrew. It's the best effort, but it's inspired. And when we do this, we, we, we have to keep this in mind because it kind of opens up understanding. Now, for instance, the New Testament meaning of the word grace, and many of you maybe know that grace, the, the Greek word that you see in your Bible in verse 7, grace is charis. Um, charis uh, combines really two elements. When Paul thinks of grace or charis, he's combining two words in the Hebrew, uh, two Old Testament words. One is hen, which hen is the, the mercy. It's a word that describes the mercy of a superior, of someone who is superior to an inferior. In this case, Almighty God, the sovereign Lord of the universe, to us. That's one thought that he has. There's another portion to the idea of grace in Paul's mind. The other one is chesed. Chesed. Chesed is the translation, if, when you, if you have a King James Bible and you read your King James, when you, when you see the, the chesed translates two, two things often. It's faithful love. You might see that faithful love or covenant love. Or sometimes it's translated as his mercies. But chesed stresses covenant, listen, covenant faithfulness. In other words, God has made a pact to be faithful. And so as we, as we combine these two words, and the, the Greek word, by the way, charis, is also used in the, in the ancient literature and is translated as beauty, kindness, and favor. Grace is a beautiful and rich thing. It's the mercy of a God toward us, reaching down to us, and, but not just momentary, but something that is lasting. It's a covenant thing. It's a sure thing. In essence, grace, one way to, to translate it is God's unbelievable. Say with me, unbelievable. unbelievable. When we say unbelievable, what are we communicating? That it's just a two... It's almost like too much to believe. Grace is God's unbelievable acceptance of us. In fact, it's so unbelievable that we often don't believe it. It's, it's actually, one author recently wrote a book about grace and, and the cross and what God has done. It's actually scandalous. Yeah. It's so unbelievable, His grace. I want to say more about that. And this is something, you know, to, to get, a, get an idea of this is, Grace is, to, to kind of flesh this out, grace is like the, the judge of the universe, the almighty judge of the universe, the gracious and holy God, inviting criminals to sit down in a meal at his home. 
That describes grace. Now the Bible clearly tells us that it was God's initiative. He grants this gift of grace in Christ. Now, you know, we, I read briefly in, during communion, I, I read a portion of Isaiah 55, and I don't have this verse out there, but Isaiah 55 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible where it says, come, all who are thirsty, come and, and drink, buy without money. And, and it was this unbelievable, unbelievable, say it with me, unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable offer. You don't have any money, that's okay. Come and buy and eat. And not just cheap McDonald's food. Amen. I love McDonald's, by the way. There's nothing better than a Big Mac. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, the, think about the greasiest, dirty diner that you've ever been to. I've been to a lot of those in my years as a salesman. We're not talking about that kind of place. We're talking about the finest. It's an invitation in Isaiah 55. Such a wonderful chapter. Because it begins with the word, ho, you know, in the, in the, in the King James, ho, it's not in the NIV. And the, the picture that is being communicated there is that the sovereign Lord of the universe has come to the streets of Jerusalem and humbled himself and become kind of like a street hawker. And in the midst of the chaos that was Jerusalem at that time, with the, you know, the Assyrians knocking on their door and the desperation that was Jerusalem, the people were distracted. They were thinking about where they were going to get their next meal. God is walking the streets of Jerusalem. And there was a shortage of water. There was a shortage of food. People were starving. Some terrible things happened during that siege. When the Assyrians surrounded the city of Jerusalem, and in the midst of that, this God is coming like a street hawker, calling the people to come to this meal. It's so ironic. I could enter more into that, but I just want to say that at the end, God says, come, buy and eat. I, what I'm offering you is not something momentary. It's not something off the cuff. I'm giving you, I'm offering you the sure mercies of David. And then he points to David, see the life that my son David enjoyed, that's the same thing that I'm offering you. You know, reading about David is so amazing because the things that David enjoyed, his life is a prophetic picture of the Messiah, but it's also a prophetic picture of each one of you and the things that you have been, you're being invited to. God is inviting the rebellious sinful people of Jerusalem at that time that weren't even thinking about him to come and enjoy and receive the sure mercies of David who was a man after his own heart. It's an amazing thing. Grace is his faithful love. His faithful love, his covenant love. And the Bible says in verse 7 that he has lavished us. It wasn't just a, a well-measured small amount. He he does measure out grace later, but when he invites us to come at the onset, he lavishes grace upon us. Now, listen to me. This is, this is so vital. Because I'm going to talk to you about today about who you are. You, you hear a lot of things about identity, but there's no better way to understand who we are than looking at this word grace. All of the wonderful stuff of chapter 1, all of those gifts that we have talked about in the past weeks, all of that, every bit of it, is what Paul is thinking about when he says in chapter 2 and verse 1, if you would turn to me, and um, Lauren, if you can project that up there, Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 1, See, we made it to chapter 2. I was talking to somebody this last week about... No, I don't want to go there. As for you, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the Spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. I'm going to come back to those verses in the coming weeks, but 
Verse 3, all of, us, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Now hold on to that because that's what we used to be before we came to Christ. We were objects of wrath. Now we're something else. Now we're objects of His love. Now we're the beloved. But look at this. Look at verse 4. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. You know, I, I just pray over and over that we never get too jaded with reading this so that we take it for granted. The lavish love of God. Now, I want to say something here. and In the coming weeks, I'm going to, I'm going to touch on some, some sacred cows. And some of them I've believed and maybe I've even shared, but as I've been reading and studying about grace, I'm letting one of them go today. Have you ever heard preachers say or people say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And as I'm saying that, you're thinking, well, I really am. What's he saying? What's he getting to? Hang on. I'm getting there. Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? We need to get to the bottom of this. But uh, I just want to tell you that I believe that that statement is really suspect. I got shirts for Jose. Uh, listen, listen, the truth, uh, because we, we, need to, we need to get to, we, we are saved by grace. This is the truth. This is the truth. We are people who are saved by grace. But I want to get to the bottom of what this means and the essence of this, because it's not about what we feel. It's not about how we feel this morning. You may not feel like the beloved this morning. You may not feel like someone who, upon whom God has lavished all grace. And maybe those verses don't give you goosebumps. But people, listen to me. Truth is not determined by my feelings. My feelings are a very poor representation of reality. And often, often the heart misleads us. Often. That's why we need the Word of God. Now, God has saved us by His grace, but to understand what this means, we have to be aware of our problem. The problem is mankind's problem. We needed to be forgiven. We needed to be forgiven because we were utterly dead. The Bible says dead in our trespasses and sins. That's true. There was no life. There was no ability. That's the theologians call this total depravity. There was no ability in us to, to find God. Karl Barth you know, talks about this in his theology and all of the books that he wrote, that really the essence of grace is God reaching out to a, a hopeless mankind that could not find Him. God had to reveal Himself to you, and He chose to do this in the person of Jesus Christ. We didn't understand. We didn't believe in the resurrection power. Or God's ability to transform us. We didn't know any of that. We were dead to all of the reality that we read about in chapter 1. Of what Jesus did for us. We needed forgiveness. Listen. We need forgiveness. But that's not our fundamental problem. Forgiveness is not. Or our need for forgiveness was not our fundamental problem. Like I, I need to lose weight. But that's not my fundamental problem. Right? My fundamental problem is the issue of why I overeat in the beginning. That goes to the essence, to the root of the problem, right? We need forgiveness, but that's not the fundamental issue. Our biggest problem is what we were. What our sin did to us. Our sin 
killed us. And the Bible says that we were born that way. We came into the world. I don't want to get to the issue of original sin at the moment. That's something that's just far beyond that. But notice what it says in verse 5. God came to us in that state. Now, a good illustration of what we were, and if you could put up verse 5 in the King James, Lauren, I want people to look at what the King James, how the King James sort of fleshes that out. Hang on with me here because this is worth the price of admission. When Jesus came for us, you know, we, we have a lot of terminology. I'm going to go after another sacred cow is that I've received Christ and that's why I'm saved. I've, I accepted Jesus. What we don't see is that when the grace of God came to us, we were like a dead man. We were like Lazarus rotting and stinking in the tomb for four days. There was no ability in Lazarus to respond or to hear Jesus. And not only was he dead and rotting, but he was wrapped up in, in, in claws. He couldn't move, even if he, if he could hear Jesus. And the Bible says that outside of that tomb, Jesus yelled and he said, Lazarus, get up! Now that is a picture of the life of the resurrection power that brings us to life. Because at one moment, God who loved you, as Jesus dearly loved Lazarus, and he wept for him when he heard that Lazarus was dead, he loved you so much that he made you alive. While you were dead, while we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. And the Bible says in Ephesians, when we were dead, say with me, dead, dead as a doornail, he has quickened us together. Now, he didn't, just, he didn't just make us live. He made us alive with Jesus. He did it. It wasn't even something I could cooperate with at the time or accept. He did it when I was dead in my trespasses and sins. That's grace. That's scandalous. That, asks, you know, that begs questions of why me? Why me? I don't know. But God loves you. And He has loved you with an everlasting love from the beginning, from before the foundation of the world. Now to illustrate this, it's like, by the way, our life is not the nature of the life that He gave us is not something isolated. It's not some weak little power source. We were made alive together with Christ so that when that grace lavished upon us came upon us, we are joined with Jesus in His resurrection power. I mean, that's an amazing thing. You know, when the power goes out in this building... We got this thing in the back there called the Frankenstein Room. And there's a piece of equipment back there. I know now why this building sat unrented for years. Because no, everybody would come in, I would suppose, and look at that room and go, what are we going to do with this? And they marched right out. But there's a machine over there that when we lose power, it kind of takes over and it connects us to these generators. And the generators come to life. There's a big diesel generator thing out there. I don't even know who puts fuel in that thing. It's a mystery. It's a mystery of the universe. <laughs> but I mean, that's not what he made. That's not what Jesus. He didn't connect us to the Frankenstein room. Amen. It's as if it's as if the power goes out and and somebody here says, you know, some bold person with a lot of faith says, "I'm going to fix this problem once and for all," and grabs you know a 15 mile piece of of cable, of copper cable, and goes over to Turkey Point to one of those nuclear reactors over there in Turkey Point and plugs it right into the nuclear power source. That's what God did. That's what He did. That's what He did. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. Did I give you that verse? You are linked with Christ right now. You're receiving resurrection power from Him. This is what quickens your spirit. Hebrews says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Look at this. This is an amazing verse of Scripture. 
Keep going. Do we have the next one? We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. All of us, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, if you have come to trust in Jesus because of the grace that He lavished upon you and made you alive in, in Him, are connected to Jesus in heaven right now. Because where is He right now? He is, he is in the very presence of the Father, in the Holy of Holies in heaven. This is an amazing thing. We have this hope. It's an anchor. So, am I just a little old sinner saved by grace? Just kind of making it in life. That might, might be how you're behaving. It might be how you feel. But it's not who you are. It's not who you are. A believer in Christ is someone who is brand new. We're not spiritual Frankensteins. Look at 1 Corinthians. Or I think, it, is it 2 Corinthians? You like that one, huh? 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, remember, made alive together with Christ. If anyone is in Christ, let, read, let's read it together. He is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Yay! The word creation at, at its root has, it has create, which means to bring something into existence out of nothing. There was nothing in me. That God could work with. That was worthy of what I now am. Now, beloved, we don't know what we will be when the fullness comes. But we know that when we see Him, when we see Him face to face, we will be as He is because we will see Him as He really is. And the, the things that you're experiencing now, the weakness in the flesh and the stuff of life is not worthy. It's not even a shadow of a smidgen in worthiness of the glory that will come, that we're, that, that we're promised as the sure mercies of God. Look at Galatians 2.20. It also highlights that. So, now listen. In Christ, you're no longer a sinner. You're no longer a sinner in Christ. Bear with me because I know you're thinking of a lot of verses of scripture right now that may say the opposite. It doesn't mean that we don't sin. Christians misbehave, but that's not your identity. Amen. That's not your identity. It's not who God says you are. Uh, would you put up Galatians 2.20 on, on the wall? Paul says, again, bringing this thing, I have been crucified, have been, past tense, with Christ, and I no longer live, but... Christ lives in me, and the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. See, to experience, this is giving us a hint, to experience the reality of who we are, we have to live by faith. Because if you live by sight, you will remain in the poor, you know, the state of, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and you will never take a step. Faith, John Wimber used to say, Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. If we want to move in faith, the Bible says the just shall what? Live by faith. So the life that we live in Christ, to experience the glories and the fullness of what we are, we have to take risks to come out of the, you know, the, the old man. He wants us to be less identified with what we were. And to be more identified with who he says that we are now the new creation. That's why we have to... It, it's faith when we tithe. Faith when we give to God. Faith when, we, when I come in here and I don't feel like worshiping and everything in me says not to move and says you have no reason and you got the little red guy over here on the left, on the right... No, he's on the left shoulder. You know, saying, you know, what reason do you have to worship this God? Curse God and die. Isn't that what he tells you in those moments of desperation? He comes and he lies because that's what he does. He's the liar. 
But it's in those very moments when I say, I'm going to worship God regardless of what I feel like. I'm going to stand up and dance. I'm going to, I'm going to shout. I'm going to use my body in some way. I'm going to get it moving because there's the power in you to do this. And as you begin to do this and something happens, something remarkable begins to happen, you get more connected to that source of power that's connected to the Holy of Holies. It's connected to Jesus. It's behind the veil. It's a sure anchor for the soul. Nobody can cut that. Every once in a while, you know, our lawn guys come and they're doing the lawn and they they got those little things, those little, you know, weed whackers and they whack the cable in front of them and they cut it. Well, that can't happen with the sure anchor. It's a sure anchor. It isn't going to be cut. New creatures. What did Paul mean by it's not I who, I no longer live. It's no longer I who live. He means that God took all that Paul used to be, that old sinner Saul. Remember his name was Saul? Word Saul means he's, Saul literally means in Hebrew, here's the guy you asked for. (laughs) Remember, you know, they wanted a king that looked like a king. Paul, interestingly, means a, the little one. He might have been a little one, but he was, he was mighty. 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 Paul took, God took that Paul that used to be, and he plugged him, permanently wired him into the Turkey Point nuclear power plant. <laughs> he disconnected him from the old roots in Adam, and he plugged Paul into the new person that he is in Christ. He experienced crucifixion, he experienced burial, and he experienced resurrection in Jesus Christ. That's, that's, now that's something that we can get excited about, right? I mean, that's something you can write home about. That's salvation. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Now, this same thing has happened to you. You're, You're not a sinner anymore. You may sin. In fact, if we say we don't sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. But that's not who you are. You say, well, what about the argument I had with my wife on the way here? Doesn't that make me a sinner? No. That's, you were behaving badly, but that's not who you are. It's not who you are. Now, I'm not saying, somebody's going to leave here and say, Pastor Ralph was preaching that old Methodist holiness thing that sinners can attain to perfection. Not saying that. Not saying that at all. Of course we sin. You know, but it's not who I am. I'll never forget to illustrate this. The first time I smoked pot after I became a Christian, it was like 19, it's a long time ago. Don't worry, it wasn't recent. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Yeah, people think that because their sins are way in the past that they're like, they don't really count anymore, you know. <laughs> and I'm not glorying in this at, at all. But I remember I had been led to the Lord and I met Christ and my, my life started to change and I was in a party and I was down and sad and somebody handed me a joint. I said, oh man, I don't do this anymore. No, go ahead, man, you're boring. And you know, I finally, I took it. But it wasn't the same. I didn't need that anymore. I knew ultimate reality. I don't need to have my state altered. I don't need that. I don't need your stuff. Keep your junk. I got the real thing. I got Jesus. I got, I said, I got Jesus. Anybody else there? I have Jesus out there. You know? And I, I felt at that moment as I was, you know, smoking that stuff, I really thought the angel of the Lord had, was going to manifest and slay me at that. It just, I couldn't enjoy it. Could not, because that's not who I was anymore. I was now a new creation in Christ. There's an old movie, you know, about 20 years ago with Dustin Hoffman called Tootsie. Remember Tootsie? Tootsie, um, Dustin Hoffman played a guy named Michael Dorsey. And Michael Dorsey, you know, was a failure, but when he dressed up like Dorothy Michaels, he was a success and everybody loved him. But despite that, Michael Dorsey wasn't Dorothy Michaels. He was still who he was. He was still a man, even though he dressed and he spoke like a man. That wasn't who he was. That was just Dustin Hoffman behaving badly. He was a man because he was born a man. 
In Christ, you who were formerly sinners have been made into something else. What is that that you have been made into? You have been made into a saint. You are now a hagios. God has taken you and he has set you apart. That old person is now dead. You are now a child of God. You're the beloved. You're the one upon whom God is focusing his love. You're the apple of his eye. Amen. Now, we hear a lot of messages on intimacy, and intimacy is, is, is just the, the key to, to a life with Christ, and we need to hear more and more and more. But sometimes maybe some of you, you, you hear messages on intimacy, and you come away, you don't feel intimacy, you don't feel connection with Christ, you, you don't really have a hunger for him. And no amount of intimacy will break the spell of a false identity until you realize who God is saying that you are. I mean, I don't know where you're getting your identity if you don't feel that you're worthy to sit at his feet and enjoy him. But it isn't from this book. It isn't from this book. It's from somewhere else. It's from your mind, your heart. But not the truth of God. No... No teaching on intimacy will cause you to want Jesus more. You'll leave this place and you'll feel as if you're a thousand miles from God and you'll go right back to looking for love in all the wrong places. And you'll be saying to yourself, I love those guys at the vineyard, but I'm just not wired that way. Or better put, you're not wired that way. Because <laughs> that's not coming from Jesus. Amen. That's a lie. Right. You are in every sense wired that way. Because you were raised up. The truth is that God, you know, sometimes you think, what could Jesus possibly want with me? Do you ever think that? I do. When the truth is that he can't possibly forget you. He can't get you out of his mind. He doesn't want to because he loves you and he wants to have intimacy with you. You were raised. But you weren't raised up from the dead in isolation. You were made alive. You're part of him. Your part, you have made alive. The Bible says together with Christ, the sinner is dead and now there's something new. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Ephesians 2. I'm staying with this. I'm not going to apologize for going over today. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> just not going to do it. Look at Ephesians 2.10. Paul's talking about, and we'll come back to more of this in the future, but Paul's talking about um, what God has done. And he says, look in verse 10, we are God. He's been talking about how we haven't been saved by works so no one can boast. We've been saved by faith. We have been saved by grace, rather, through faith. And this is not from yourself. Grace, listen to me, grace operates through faith. Now faith, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the measure of faith. You have to learn to exercise that faith to experience the lavishness of His grace. Now watch. Paul says, for we are God's what? Workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I'm going to take more of that later, but I just want you to focus. Put your finger on that little word if you've got your Bible. Workmanship. Workmanship. I love it because it's in the NIV. It's in most of the major translations. The King James translators use this word. Um, and they used a word here that in their day meant something different. It meant, it was an English word for a, a poetic creation. For something that was not just a couple of lines written on a, on a scrap piece of paper. But it was a work of art. See, this is what a poem, a poem... You know, if you write a letter, you know, unless you're really, you know, William Shakespeare, 
your letters are not poetic. But some of you are poets and you don't know it. But when you sit down and you write a poem, a poem is art. It's beauty if you've read the great poets. If you love poetry, if you don't, you should fall in love with poetry. But poetry is a work of art. It's a work of art. The, the New Living Translation translates that word. It says, you are a divine masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. You're a divine masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. I mean, this is who you are. This is what God... God you read the great, you know, the great poets and some of those poems, as you read them, they, they, they just give you goosebumps because of their beauty or some songs give you goosebumps. You give God goosebumps because He's created you as a divine masterpiece. The New Testament says 63 times, just in case you weren't paying attention, that you're a saint. A saint is a holy one. This is the outcome of God's work in Christ. God gave everything. He gave everything to make you into this. He gave of Himself. He poured Himself out. That's been His plan from the beginning. It cost Him the life of His only begotten Son. It's something that we can't fathom. The one who has, had been with Him from before the foundation of the world, the, the beloved second person of the Trinity, He freely gave Him to make you into the, this divine masterpiece. God doesn't make trash. There are no children of a lesser God. The Greeks used to believe that, that when they looked at the poor and they, they saw their calamity and their condition, they would say, they're poor or they're sick. Because they're children of a lesser God. And I, you know, the kings used to say, I am the son of Zeus. And that's why I have this power and authority and beauty. But all of you, all of you are saints. It says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, it says, Paul writes to the church in Corinth. If you want to get, you know, a picture of a mess of a church, read, read the books to the Corinthians. To that church, Paul says, those sanctified in Christ, set aside and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord. He calls them holy in Hebrews 10.10. 10. It says that by His will we have been made holy, have been made through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Listen. When God calls you sanctified one or holy one, He's not referring to your behavior. He knows your behavior. Amen. He's referring to your identity. Yes. Yes. He's referring to who you are, not your temporary lapses. Now, this is the key to walking in freedom, and you have to believe the Bible on this. It's not what you feel, but it's what the revelation of the divine word of God says that you are. Make no mistake about this. You are a saint of God, a beloved masterpiece, a treasure. You're the object of God's love. And there's no lapse. That's a promise that comes. It's a covenant love, the sure mercies of David. This is the only thing that God offers. He offers nothing less. He doesn't offer plan B or C. Sometimes Christians, you know, th think that. They think, well, you know, I'm, you know, I know there's this calling in my life, but, you know. <laughs> now look at Paul. I mean, you know, I know, I know what verse you're thinking about. I know what verse you're thinking about. I know it because I was thinking about that verse. You're thinking about 1 Timothy 1.15, where Paul says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. And so we're all thinking, you know, but, but I, want, here, I want you to bear with me. Do you think, do you really think for a moment that Paul believed when he wrote that to Timothy that he was currently out sinning everyone? Do you think that he meant that? That at that moment... That he was out sinning. And that's not what he meant. He was talking about what he was. I, I brought that verse up because I know the mind. Because <laughs> I'm the same way. 
The battlefield, as Joyce Meyer says, is right here. In the mind. In the mind. That's why the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It doesn't tell you how, it just assumes that you can. Because you have resurrection power. And so you can just say, mind, think something else. In other words, think about this. Because you can. Because you have been set free. And that old man has been crucified and put to death. Now, you know, Muhammad Ali, remember Muhammad Ali? He used to be called Cassius Clay. He ran around all the time saying, I'm the champion of the world. He's still saying that, that he was the champion of the world. Now, he said that even though, you know, he, he only lost a few times, but now he's just, you know, kind of this old guy struggling with a lot of things because he took some hard knocks. But, I mean, he, his records are still unparalleled. The, the layoff that, he, you know, after he... Most of you aren't old enough to remember what happened with Cassius or, or Muhammad Ali, but he refused to go to Vietnam, and, and, and so he couldn't box for years and years. So he went from being the world champion to being... They wouldn't let him box. What he did, nobody else has ever been able to do. He came back from, I think it was about a seven-year layoff, and won the crown again. He won the crown. His records are unsurpassed. And so this is the same thing that, that Paul is saying. He is, you know, he was the chief of sinners back then. But now he's something else. His identity is something else. He's the champion of the world. Yeah. Yeah. You're the champion of the world. Hey, if you ever heard him before a boxing match, I mean, I mean, that guy had confidence. He knew who he was, even though you know the public wasn't believing in him. I'm almost done. I can tell because I've only got one page of notes. <laughs> what Paul meant in 1 Timothy 1.15 is that before he met Christ, before he met Christ, nobody could approach his sinning record. He persecuted Christians. He put them to death. He knew who he was. He, he knew his roots, and that kind of kept him humble. It, 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 but it didn't, it didn't incapacitate him. He wasn't so focused on what he was that he couldn't walk into and live out what he was now. A saint in Christ set aside. You see, his past life just made him give God more glory. Because he would say, look, that's what I was. But God. But God. But God. But God. <laughs> you see, because one day, that sinner, that Saul, was on the way to a place called Damascus. And Paul would talk about that. And he would say, oh, that wonderful day. Day I will never forget. Heaven came down and glory filled his soul. Remember that song if you're old enough? Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. And I don't remember the other part, but it says, <laughs> Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and the night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. He's lavished His grace on you. Lavished without measure. You've been lavished with grace. So you're not just a sinner saved by grace. That grace has made you into something else. A new creation in Christ. You see, and this is what, this is what we have to get right. This is what we have to get right. Is who we are. Because that's what... That's, Paul says that in chapter 1. Remember... Says all these wonderful things. God has redeemed you. He's adopted you. He's lavished love upon you. You're saints. You know, you've been plugged into the resurrection power. And then he goes on this long sentence. And do you have 1 Corinthians 17? Put up 1 Corinthians 17 to verse 23. And let's, I want us all to read this together because 
this is what the passion of Paul for the Ephesians was that they would get this. That the eyes of their understanding, verse 17 of Ephesians, chapter... Ephesians or Corinthians? Corinthians, I say Corinthians, Ephesians. There's a little circuit in there sometimes and it, it doesn't fire right. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, it's that prayer. It's that prayer. It's that prayer. And he says, I keep asking. After he says all this stuff, I keep asking. Now, I want you to know that when he, as he, was, he was in ecstasy at this moment. Remember, this was a, a song of redemption. He was swept up into the, he had been up in Mount Everest, you know, looking down at the expanse of the glory that, of God's plan to bring everything together in, in Christ. And he doesn't want the Ephesians to miss this. He doesn't want them to miss it. And so he says, I keep asking all the time. Even he was in prison. I keep asking. Oh, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? So you may know him better. And I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And it's in, he's not done yet. He took a deep breath in verse 19. <gasps> and his incomparable great power to us who believe that power. He not done that is the longest sentence in the world. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms. Now, in the spirit, the way this looked like was Jesus is dead, the devil is having a party. The demons are swarming in the second heavens and they're thinking, oh, it's over, we've done. He's dead as a doornail. And then all of a sudden God exerts the power and he resurrects Jesus. And before those demons could know it, the Son of God is soaring through the heavens at the speed of light to the very throne of God. And this is the this is the power. This is the power that is at work in you. So you're not a little sinner saved by grace, barely making it. I don't care how much, how little is in your bank account. You think you're going to take that to heaven with you? You know, as my old friend Kevin, used, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. These light and momentary troubles, listen, these light and momentary troubles are working in you. And the exceeding weight of glory is at work in you. And man, one day, one day, one day, you'll see. You'll stand before him. And maybe you'll have wished, God, I wish I would have believed more of this sooner I wish I would have prayed that prayer I didn't even finish it did I oh I didn't finish it oh I gotta, gotta finish that prayer gotta finish that prayer gotta finish that prayer because it's not over it says in, and he exerted this power in Christ when he raised him from the dead verse 21 far above all rule and authority power and dominion and every title that can be given, man, those authorities and rulers and dark places, they thought they had him down. And he raised him. And then he, look at this. And far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And here, we're done. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. One day every knee shall bow. Right now he's ruling. And so the church is a prophetic body. It's a prophetic representation of the glories that are to come. So that's why the second part of the book is this is what you are. Start behaving that way. The book is basically sit, sit, 
you're seated with Christ. And because you're seated with Christ, you have the power to walk. You can walk out these things. And because you can walk, then you can stand. You can stand against anything. Against anything that comes against you. Anything. Father, I pray that out of the riches of your mercy for the people here, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding. That we would know you better. And that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. That we may know the hope. The hope to which you have called us. And that hope will not disappoint because that hope is anchored in heaven. And it's a sure thing. Help us to see that. This side of eternity. And I pray that the Father would give you his peace and fill you with more and more.